coming into summer where people often try to get away, get some refreshing and R&R kind of things. And so I want to talk a little bit about the spiritual aspects of that. We started last Sunday. This Sunday I want to talk about inner peace a little bit more. Started unpacking it last Sunday. I want to kind of take it to another level today. Almost invariably, before we go away on holidays, something happens. Something highly stress-inducing happens. It often results, and I'm just going to be completely transparent here, it often results in Shelley and I having what Harry calls intense fellowship. And uh, we end up leaving on holidays feeling a bit uptight and anxious. Does that ever happen to any of you? Nobody? Okay, well, I guess I, we're all on our own. Now, Shelly and I don't do a lot of camping, but last year we did actually pull our trailer on a road trip and so on. And um, this doesn't happen too often for us, but when you're in a campground, you can see this happening in all kinds of situations. I actually saw a, a little thing on the Internet a couple weeks ago said, True friendship is being able to love one another right after you've finished backing the trailer in. Okay, so there are a few people that get that. That is very stressful. And often you're almost ready to get a second campsite for half of the family after you've finished backing the camper into the campsite. And uh, often when we go to rest or to be refreshed, it actually starts off with something not so restful. So I want to look at what Jesus had to say about um, rest and peace. You see, I mentioned this last week, you can't really rest unless you have peace on the inside. I mean, you can physically slow down, and that's helpful for sure. But you really need to have inner peace in order to really, really rejuvenate. So I want to look at John, what John had to say about Jesus. John was Jesus' very best friend. So this is not third-hand information. He is telling us firsthand exactly what he heard Jesus say. So I'm going to go to John chapter 14 starting in verse 23. So Jesus replied, All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. I am telling you these things now while I still am with you. But when the Father sends the Advocate, as my representative, that is, the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give, so don't be troubled or afraid. So Jesus left us with this gift called peace. What exactly is this gift of peace that Jesus gave his followers? So Jesus was talking to a group of Jews here. He, he, he walked in Israel. The, actually, the modern day Israel is the same geographic area that Jesus walked in 2,000 years ago. And so there's Jewish people all around him, and those are the people that he talked to. And they would have likely understood what Jesus said this way. 
The reason I'm starting with that is because this, whenever you read the Bible, you need to understand, first of all, what Jesus said would have meant to the original audience. When you understand how they would have understood what he said, then you can understand how that might apply to us today. If you just skip uh, that process, you can easily end up misinterpreting what Jesus has to say. So here's how they would have understood it. The Jews had a long history of walking with God. It started with a guy named Abraham. How many of you have heard of Abraham before? Yeah, I mean, Abraham is often considered sort of one of the early fathers of the modern human race. The Jews consider him their father, the father of the Jewish race. I remember when I was a kid, we used to sing a song about Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them. So are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Yeah, yeah, that's right, right arm, left arm, and it goes spin around and sit down, and it was a crazy song. Anyway, if you didn't sing that song when you were a kid, you didn't miss a lot because it, it was really crazy. But anyway, that Father Abraham was their father. And so God promised Abraham that he would have a descendant once a, later on down the road somewhere, and he didn't say exactly who it would be or when it would be, that would become a blessing to the whole world, that would bring peace to the world. And so the Jews that, that had be, you know, were jo uh, Abraham's descendants had been waiting for this person who was going to be a blessing to the whole world for hundreds of years, literally. And they had this whole anticipation thing had grown into this family that someday this person was going to come. And, and then uh, they, they had developed all these ideas about what this person was going to be like, what he was going to do, how he was going to bring peace, and so on and so forth. And, um, and then the interesting thing, which so often happens, is they started to sort of forget about the rest of the world. Like the whole promise from the beginning was that this person was going to bring peace to the whole world, but they started to forget about the rest of the world, and they just were looking forward to the peace he was going to bring to Israel. And so they started to get kind of self-centered, which can easily happen to the best of us. And then when they started to think about this person, they started to think about the peace he was going to bring to Israel and to Jerusalem. And they started talking about the peace of Jerusalem. And actually, uh, interestingly, Jerusalem actually means city of peace. Now, nowadays, it's, there's not a lot of peace in Jerusalem, but that's actually literally what the name Jerusalem means, is city of peace or place of peace. And so they, they had sort of forgotten about everybody else, but they had this amazing sense that he was going to come and bring peace to Jerusalem. So God knew that the only way to bring genuine peace and blessing to people was through inner transformation. He knew that, you know, negotiating peace treaties and things like that only bring superficial peace ultimately to groups of people. But ultimately, if we're going to experience profound peace, it has to be on a, on a deeper level for each of us as individuals. And so, individuals have to connect with this peace. The problem is, we as humans don't have the capacity to do that on our own. We don't have the capacity within ourselves to transform our hearts, our inner world, from dispeace or unpeace or disharmony or whatever you want to call it to a place of inner peace. We can't do it. We don't have that capacity on our own. But we 
ever like to try. That none of us wants to admit that we can't do something. We want to figure out a way. There's got to be a way to do this. Now, some people are more like this than others, and I'll have to admit here that I am one of those stubborn people that has a hard time to admit defeat when it comes to figuring something out. Like, I have this inner thing, there's got to be a way to figure this out. Now, YouTube has been a wonderful to me. Because you can find a YouTube video on how to fix or figure something out for almost anything that we, we uh, meet. And if it's not on YouTube, it's certainly on the Internet. And, you know, Google uh, has the answer to everything, right? No? I heard somebody say, I don't need Google because my wife knows everything. <laughs> but uh, Google does know pretty much everything. And so for people like me that are passionate about figuring things out, it's, it's a wonderful thing. The problem is sometimes we have to admit we can't figure this out on our own. See, we can figure out temporary relief. We talked about this last week. There's temporary ways in which we can make ourselves feel better. And those things look different. Lots of different people try different ways. But the problem is it only gives temporary relief. And God knew that the Jews were very similar to the way I am in that they sort of needed to try every angle to figure this out on their own before they would be ready to listen to somebody else, to listen to him in particular. And so God actually did this interesting thing. Maybe you've tried this with your kids, I don't know. But God basically said, okay, if you are so determined to figure this out on your own, go for it. Knock yourself out. Just have at her. And so, and, and actually, what he did was, he, he said, and, and really what that meant was they were going to figure out their own religious system. And I mean, let's face it, all religion is about figuring out a way to find inner peace. And so God went so far as to say, look, I'll even help you design the best religious system in the world. And so he gave them the Old Testament. The first two-thirds of our Bible is the Old Testament. And that's the Jewish religion. They still follow that to this day. And basically, God designed this religious system for them to figure out how to find peace on their own. And he said, okay, have at her. Knock yourself out. Do your very best. Give it your absolute best shot. And so they took what God gave them and they added all these extra things on there to you know, improve on what God had said. And for hundreds of years, they tried their absolute utmost to find peace on the inside. And it didn't work. They basically completely knocked themselves out, trying as hard as they possibly could. And let's face it, probably nobody has tried quite as hard as the Jews have to find peace with God. And the truth is, some of them are still trying with that same religious system to find peace with God, and it, it never worked. Still hasn't worked. And then God sent Jesus. I want to read Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. And Galatians 3, verse 19 talks about the transition between this. See, the law is what the Old Testament is about, basically. He says, why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise, the promise of that was 
to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. God gave his law through angels to Moses, who was the mediator between God and the people. So here we see God gave them this system to try to figure this out on their own as a temporary stopgap measure until this promised person, descendant of Abraham, would come who would bring peace to their hearts. And so God never intended for the law, the old covenant system, to be the permanent solution. It was always just a temporary thing that was there until Jesus would come. And then, and then uh, when Jesus came, he brought a whole new different way of approaching God. So when Jesus said, I give you this peace, that was the context in which the Jews would have understood this. That they were looking for this peace. They had been striving for this peace for hundreds of years and hadn't been able to find it. And now Jesus came and he says, okay, now I'm going to give you this gift. So you can see that they would have been going, whoa, who are, who are you claiming to be? What, what are you talking about here? Now, today, in our culture, a lot of people have walked away from organized religion in our part of the world. Now, there's lots of other parts of the world where organized religion is still going very strong, whether it's Christianity or whether it's Islam or Buddhism or other religion. There are other parts of the world where, that are very religious and still really, really trying to figure this out, how to find peace on the inside. But in our part of the world, organized religion has kind of had its day, sort of walking away from that, going, ah, it doesn't work. And the truth is, they're right. It doesn't work. It has never worked. It was never intended but now people in our part of the world are turning to other things to try to find peace. And we've talked about those. Some people look to success to bring them inner peace. Some people look to drugs and alcohol to bring inner peace. Some people look to money to bring peace. Some people look for, you know, friends or fame or whatever. There's all kinds of different ways that people in our culture are looking to find that inner peace. And I submit to you that actually it works very similar to religion in many ways. It brings temporary relief, but no real permanent peace deep inside. Now, there are pros and cons with every different approach. Don't get me wrong. There are some things that work better with some approaches and some things that don't work nearly as good. But every approach actually ultimately falls short and never brings the deep inner peace that we are looking for. So what is it exactly that Jesus is promising here then? So Jesus, like I said, was in a Jewish context. The Jewish word for peace is shalom. And notice when I, I mentioned before Jerusalem, salem, and shalom are the same word. So jeru Salem, that's where the peace, the place of peace comes from. But the word shalom has way more meaning than the word peace has. Our word peace is actually a very shallow word compared to the Jewish word shalom. So let me just read you the definition of shalom. It means completeness, 
wholeness, health, peace, welfare, safety, soundness, tranquility, prosperity, perfectness, full, fullness, rest, harmony, the absence of agitation or discord. You just stop and think about that for a minute. That is true inner harmony when you think about it. And this is the gift that Jesus was offering them and offering us. It wasn't just that, you know, we'll work out our differences and everybody will be fine. He was actually promising profound inner transformation. You know, when, uh, when you feel like everything has come together, there's this little phrase we use, all is well in the world. That's kind of the essence, if you will, of shalom. Not that everything has been resolved, but in my heart, it feels like all is well in the world. And the interesting thing is, this is a gift. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to jump through hoops to get it. We just have to receive it and then learn how to live in it. And the interesting thing is, in this verse, he talks about the advocate, which is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes as a personal mentor to help us learn how to live in peace or how to be transformed in our minds so that we see things through the lenses of peace. See, Jesus' death and resurrection actually paid the price for this gift. His death and resurrection, if you will, took care of all unshalom, the non-shalom of our inner world was taken care of or was removed, if you will, through Jesus. Now, what, what does that ultimately look like? Or what does that mean? See, at the very root of all of this, there's this issue of being out of harmony with God. The only way to have the deepest level of inner peace is to feel at peace with God. When we don't have that peace with God, we ultimately cannot have the rest of the peace that flows out of that. And so God, through Jesus, set in place a way for us to com connect with God without any disharmony in that connection. And there's many different ways in which you can define that disharmony. The Bible often calls it sin. Sin is a kind of a bad word in our culture, and, and people shy away from that. You can define sin in all kinds of different ways. The truth is, most of us, unless you're a sociopath, have this inner sense of angst about being a good person. We want to believe that we are a good person. And that is what this is ultimately about. Can I become in my own power a good person, a truly good person, or do I need help, God's help in particular? And basically all religion revolves around proving in some way, shape, or form that I am a good person. And we like to think of it as proving to other people, but ultimately, if we get really gut honest, religious activity revolves around proving to myself that I'm a good person. I don't, I, you don't have to put up your hands, you don't have to say a word here, but if you got really gut honest with yourself, does coming to church on a Sunday morning help you to feel like a good person. 
if that is part of the motivation for coming to church, that means this is a religious activity. And I'm sorry to disappoint you, but that's not going to actually help you. Church is not intended to make you feel like a good person. Church is actually intended to help all of us connect with God who gives us the gift of what the Bible calls righteousness, which is true goodness. And so we don't come to church in order to make ourselves feel like good people. We come to church to learn how to receive the gift of forgiveness and righteousness. And there is a profound difference there. Some of us are, don't have the self-awareness to, to see that going on inside of us. But if you stop and really get quiet in the inside, sometimes you can understand some of the motivations that drive us to do what we are doing. And Jesus basically came to open the door for us to come into true inner shalom. And he gave us the Holy Spirit to teach us how to think, how to live, how to be in this environment, in this reality. This was ultimately what God promised Abraham way, way back. His promise to Abraham was that one of his descendants would eventually come to earth to open the door for the gift of true shalom, not just for the Jewish people, but for everyone. So the Jews had sort of gotten sidetracked along the way, but Jesus came to kind of get everything back on track, and not only back on track, but actually open up a whole new world to us. This is what the Bible calls the gospel, the good news. Jesus has done something that no other person could do for us. That means that after Jesus died and rose from the dead, which is one of the most well-documented events in the history of the world, it actually created a pathway for every single person on the planet to experience the inner transformation of true peace. What a gift. When Jesus said, I give you this gift of peace, not like the world gives, that's what he meant. He gave us peace at a level that no other religious activity or addiction or any other Thing on the planet could do for us. What an amazing gift. So we no longer have to work for peace. We no longer have to strive for it. We just have to let God lead us into it. Now, I want to I want to kind of give you the heads up. The process of being led into this peace sometimes is the process sometimes gets worse before it gets better. It's a little bit like you know when you you've got a, a wound that's not healing and you have to clean the wound out first before it'll heal. It's a little bit like that in our journey towards this inner peace. Sometimes the Holy Spirit has to bring to the surface the real things that are causing us dis-peace or unpeace so that he can clean that out before we can truly begin to experience that. So sometimes when people start to follow Jesus, they go, I thought this was supposed to make me more peaceful and happy. It's only made it worse initially. And my encouragement to you is, is, is if you're experiencing that right now, hang in there. It gets better. It sometimes gets worse before it gets better, but if you stay true, you will experience that transforming inner peace. It will take hold. It will bring you to that place. 
And once that spiritual foundation is in place, you will begin to experience a, a joy, a peace, a harmony, and all of those things that are part of shalom at a level that goes beyond anything you probably could have anticipated. I guarantee it, if you continue to walk with Jesus through that process. So there's the exact that I was watching on TV. It, it, it could have been it could have been something with Hollywood. It could have been something with sports. I can't remember. But I, I remember, you know, they were giving speeches after they were receiving these awards, which, of course, is quite common. And then they, they, after they had given their speech, they, they interviewed each of the award winners. And I remember this young lady had won an award, and unfortunately I can't remember the exact award now, but they interviewed her and, and asked her this big ethereal question, what is your deepest wish now that you've received this award? And I remember her saying, my wish is for world peace. And I remember thinking, well, that's a pretty grandiose kind of a wish. But it, you know, I mean, it's a nice wish. And certainly, you know, it felt, you know, in the moment, like it was kind of a, a nice thing to say. And then later it struck me. That was Jesus' wish, too. Jesus' wish was for world peace. The difference between that young lady and Jesus was that she could maybe, you know, say some nice words and do a few nice deeds, but there was really very little she could ultimately do to make a very big impact on world peace. But Jesus... He actually did something profound to bring about world peace. He, it's not that he got involved in negotiating peace between nations and, and stuff like that, but what he did do is lay the foundation for world peace. He opened the door for every single individual human being to experience transformation at the deepest level and find peace for their souls. And that is the key to world peace. See, when there's peace in your heart, that can lead to peace between you and your neighbor and you and your spouse, and you and your kids. And when there's peace in the home, that opens the door for peace in the community. And when there's peace in the community, that opens the door for peace in the nation. And when there's peace in the nation, that opens the door for peace in the world. It all starts with you and me and Jesus. That's the key right there. I don't know where you're at with Jesus today, but if you have never invited him in and received his gift to you, today would be a great day to start that journey of transformation with him. And if you are kind of going, well, I don't even know where to start with that, we can actually help you with that. This Jesus journey is what we're all about, actually. So I'm going to ask the prayer team to stand right over there by the cross. And in a minute, uh, our, our uh, worship team, Pastor Michelle and Colleen here, they're going to play a song. And while we, they play the song, if you would like to accept Jesus' gift of peace, I invite you to just slip over to them and s just tell them that. Say, hey, you know, I... I don't think I've ever accepted this gift. 
I'd like to do that. And they will walk you through what that means and how to do that. And then, the second thing that is so important in our culture in particular, where we are living at an absolutely breakneck speed, is to slow down long enough to listen to our mentor, the Holy Spirit, deep inside of us as he wants to teach us how to live in peace. And so I invite you as, as we conclude our service here today to just slow yourself down on the inside and say to the Holy Spirit, teach me how to live in peace. And then, not just here, start to make that a lifestyle of really slowing down to listen to God. And surround yourself with people that are on that same journey because you can learn from each other uh, how to do that. And, you know, find friends that are are learning how to listen to God. And you can learn from each other on that journey. It's, the truth is, we all learn a little bit differently. We, we learn from God differently. We learn from teachers differently. We all have different learning styles, if you will. And as we conclude our service here today, I actually would be really curious to find out from every one of you what way you learn from the Holy Spirit the best. So I'm going to ask Rosalie to put my number on the screen. And there's my question. What way do you learn best from the Holy Spirit? And as Pastor Michelle leads us in this song, I'm going to ask you to get your phone out and text me the answer to that question. Just send it to me, and then I, I, I'm just really curious how you learn best from the Holy Spirit. And maybe it, with your permission later on, I might share some of those answers, but I'm not going to do that without your permission, don't worry. But I, I'm just really curious to hear how the Holy Spirit works and teaches you in your heart of hearts. So let's take a minute here and quiet ourselves before God. And Pastor Michelle will dismiss us in a minute. Go ahead. <laughs>